Welcome to this event uh, organized by GUCAS, uh, Gothenburg University Network for Critical Animal Studies in the Anthropocene. Uh, GUCAS is a cross-disciplinary network for critical animal studies and um, social injustice and sustainability. Our aims and visions are to explore novel approaches to environmental problems, uh, social injustice and uh, climate change and to provide uh, input to course developments and research practice and contribute to, uh, to an ethically and environmentally sustainable campus free from the use of animals and to work towards a transition to um, uh, plant-based food on campus. We aim to create a space uh, for knowledge production, exchange, and collaboration by creating a platform where uh, people from different parts of universities, such as teachers, students, and staff, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, social movements and civil society in general, could come together and collaborate. Uh, we aim to collaborate both locally and globally. And we would like to thank uh, uh, for our supporter, uh, Gustav Adolf Brath Foundations for uh, providing us with this opportunity for these kind of seminars and collaborations. Well, anyone interested in the work of GUCAS is more than welcome to join our network. Now I give the floor to Helena. Helena. Thank you, Nari. Yes, thank you very much for that. Um, so I also want to warmly welcome everyone to this GUCAS webinar with Dinesh Vadival. Uh, my name is Helena Pedersen. I am co-founder of the GUCAS network. And on behalf of the organizing team, I have the pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dinesh, Associate Professor Dinesh Vadival, at Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, Professor Dinesh Vadivel is a social and political theorist specializing in human rights, disability rights, and socio-legal studies. He is a prominent scholar in critical animal studies and has played a key role in advancing theories of violence and Foucauldian approaches in the field, showing how Michel Foucault's theories of power can and should be applied to human-animal relations in an era characterized by neoliberal politics intensified systems of animal production and escalating ecological disaster. Dinesh Vadivel is the author or editor of five important books, Communicating Difference, Understanding Communications Consumers from Non-English Speaking Backgrounds, Animals in the Anthropocene, Critical Perspectives on Non-Human Futures, The War Against Animals, which is also translated into Japanese, Foucault and Animals, and most recently, Animals in Capital, that is published by Edinburgh University Press. He has also published numerous research articles and book chapters on animal politics and multi-species justice. Dinesh Wadiwal is engaged with academic advocacy for humans and animals and also engaged with several civil society organizations. He has received an award from the National Ethnic Disability Alliance for his work for the rights of migrants with disabilities. And he has also co-authored recent reports on disability justice uh, commissioned by the Australian Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. He's a member of the Multispecies Justice Research Group at the University of Sydney and chair of the Australasian Animal Studies Association. So the title of Dinesh's lecture today is Factory Farms for Fishes, Critically Understanding the Development of Industrial Aquaculture. And given the enormous importance of the sea for ecosystem and climate stability, as well as the often neglected issue of large scale violence and exploitation of marine animals, we greatly look forward to learning from you today, Dinesh. So please welcome Dinesh Vadival. And I give the floor to you now, Dinesh. Thanks. Thanks so much, Helena, for such a generous welcome. And uh, thank you to Gukas for the invitation to speak. It's just, it is such an honor. and. and always exciting to me to see new critical animal studies networks popping up around the world um, and really nice to be able to, to speak to people involved in them. Um, <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge the land that I'm on. 
So I'm coming from Sydney. Sydney is a settler colonial nation. Uh, it's founded upon the theft of land from Indigenous people. And I acknowledge the Wongal people who are the traditional owners of the land that I am on here in central Sydney. Um, so let me firstly just share my slides. And then I can get started. Hopefully you can see that. Human relations with fishes globally are arguably one of the central sites of conflict and tension occurring with animals and food systems occurring today at a planetary scale. Fisheries are today important, an important component of the global economy, with seafood products one of the world's most traded food commodities. Today, fisheries have been positioned as a central pillar of human food supplies. It is estimated that annually up to 2.3 trillion fishes are captured on the oceans. Leaving aside the impact upon the trillions of animals who are targets of this industry, the environmental impact of the growth of industrialised fisheries are deeply concerning. In 1990, around 10% of global fish populations, or as the industry calls them, fish stocks, were extracted from the seas at unsustainable level levels. By 2019, this figure, figure rose to 35.4%. From this perspective, the last 50 years of industrialised fisheries might be understood as a slow process of emptying the oceans of fishes. Daniel Pauly claims um, that over the last century, populations of large fish, such as bluefin tuna and Atlantic cod, have been reduced by around 90%. So for individual populations, there, there's been quite lots of dramatic changes. These extraordinary statistics are more depressing when wastage data is taken into account. For example, catch reconstruction suggests that, suggests that unreported discards from, the industrial, from industrial fisheries, that is non-marketable fish species who are killed and thrown back into the oceans, account for a significant proportion of annual wild fish capture more than total global subsistence fishing, that is subsistence fishing, not industrial scale fishing. Global fisheries are responsible for another transformation, which is also planetary scale in nature, namely the arrival of industrial aquaculture or fish farms. Aquaculture relies on the use of expansive sea pens in waterways where sea animals are contained and intensively managed in order to transform these living animals into food for consumption by humans. The progress in the expansion of fish farms globally has been breathtaking. In 2014, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization notified the world that for the first time, more than half of the fish consumed by humans were derived from aquaculture. We should not underestimate the full significance of the achieve <coughs> achievement of this milestone in terms of human, or at least, <clears throat> Anthropocene history, where domestication of land-based animals took millennia to achieve, recent humans have managed to apply domestication to fish on a mass scale in a mere number of decades. The rise of aquaculture marks an important development in biopolitical relations with non-human life. On one hand, insofar as aquaculture has enabled changing human diets, including rising global per capita consumption of seafood, this transformation in food supplies marks <clears throat> an alteration in the relation between humans and fishes at the level of population, where sea life more centrally serves as a function in the reproduction of human life. On the other hand, intensification of domesticated fish <clears throat> production requires the development of biopolitical techniques in the management of non-human life to, the, to extract, contain, regulate, and slaughter sea animals with attended technological developments around sea pens, feeding, transport, and biobehavioral intervention. <clears throat> You'll have to pardon me, I'm recovering from a cold. My talk today seeks to examine the rise of industrial aquaculture, factory farms for fishes, using a biopolitical lens I'll firstly take a global view of fisheries as a problem of the biopolitics of population. As I shall argue, the industrialization of wild capture fisheries 
followed by the development of intensive aquaculture, represents a systematic process, process of establishing fishes as a population, which is placed in the service of human populations as a means of subsistence. Secondly, I'll look at the modalities of techniques and te technologies within aquaculture, <clears throat> noting the ways in which these sites are intensifying as a means to more precisely produce a bare life amongst the beans contained within aquaculture facilities. Finally, I'll consider the limits of the control apparatus of intensive aquaculture and possibilities for fish resistance. As I shall note, as overwhelming as these changes have been for refining the, the refined, refined modalities of domination over animals, aquaculture also op opens different problems for power and resistance. Intensification of fish production within sea pens creates new problematics of visibility and, visibility and control and thus establishes different patterns for animals in subordination to rule, i.e. animal resistance. Let's start by thinking about the global biopolitics of fisheries. In Raj Patel and Jason W. Moore's A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things, cheap food is singled out as one of the most important global developments in the history of capitalism, insofar as it provided an engine for both holding down wages and expanding profit. Patel and Moore described the rationale as follows. The cheap food model worked like this. Capitalism's agricultural revolutions provided cheap food, which lowered the minimum wage threshold. Workers could be paid less and not starve. <clears throat> this in turn reduced employers' wage bills as the scale of proletarianization increased, allowing the rate of exploitation to rise. Accumulated capital could continue to grow only insofar as a rising food surplus underwrote cheap workers. It's a simple model, end quote. For Patel and Moore, the meat industry was shaped by these cheap food dynamics. An example of these processes and one that Patel and Moore focus on is the dramatic increase in global chicken populations during the 20th century. These birds were leapt upon by capitalist agriculture as a means to dramatically expand the production of animal-based food. Patel and Moore argue, and I quote, that the chickens we eat today are very different from those consumed a century ago. Today's birds are the result of intensive post-World War II efforts, <coughs> drawing on genetic materials sourced freely from Asian jungles, which humans decided to recombine to produce the most profitable fowl. That bird can barely walk, reaches maturity in weeks, has an oversized breast, and is reared and slaughtered in geological, geologically significant quality quantities, i.e. more than 60 billion birds per year. I think currently at 70 billion birds per year. In effect, Patel and Moore are paying attention to a number of processes that describe the interaction of capitalism and biopolitics. <clears throat> On one hand, there is the relation that is constructed at a population level between chickens and humans. Capitalist agriculture will mass produce and reproduce chickens as a population whose cycles of life and death coincide with the func their functionality as a means of subsistence for human populations. <coughs> this is thus not only the story of chicken bodies overproduced as a mechanism to drive down the reproductive costs of human labor uh, in order to extract more profit. It is also the story of one biological population, i.e. chickens, being placed in proximity with another, i.e. humans, and with this, an establishment of a life and death relationship where one population must be born and made to die in order to, for another population to survive. The rise of chicken as a global food staple from the perspective of human animal studies is the story of the construction of a global standing population <coughs> whose biopolitical function is to secure the life of another population, i.e. humans. In this sense, as James Danescu has pointed out, within capitalist agriculture, a conception of biopolitics which involves the fostering of life meets brutally with a thanatopolitics thanat politics of deadening life or making life dead at the same time. There is a second sense in which Patel and Moore usefully highlights the relation between capitalism and biopolitics. And this relates to the refinement of processes which sculpt the body of the chicken to become a means of subsistence for human life. 
as described by many animal studies scholars, <coughs> industrial animal agriculture establishes a zone of bare life in which animal bodies are contained, surveyed, subject to bodily modifications, deep controls over nutrition, lighting, movement, relationality, reproduction, and sexuality, i.e. the factory farm. <coughs> the biological lives of these animals are bent to conform with the rhythms of production of the production process. And as Patel and Moore argue, production time, that is birth to death time, is subject to continuing efficiencies as are rel the relative yield that is produced by these industries. All of this aims to maximize profit. We might apply a similar lens to understanding the biopolitics of fisheries globally. However, in doing so, we'll have to depart from previous analyses of the biopolitics of land-based animal agriculture. This is because industrialized fisheries differ in form. In part, this is because fishes killed for human food supplies are derived from two very different modalities of production. Namely, firstly, industrialized wild fish capture, and secondly, intensive aquaculture. <coughs> And one reason I'd say that this is important is that when we see, look at land-based animals, the factory farm is the one modality uh, that is the tendency of capitalist production processes. But when we look at fisheries, we see these two different forms. On one hand, wild fish cap capture fisheries operate in a way that is completely unlike the factory farm model of capitalist food production. As discussed, while fish capture is a modality of mechanized human predation, and thus presents a very different problem for biopolitical analysis. While fishes are not contained by agricultural systems, instead, they are hunted down in the vast commons of the sea. On the other hand, as will be the focus soon of my talk, the growth in industrial agriculture globally has created a completely new model of the factory farm. While industrial aquaculture mirrors intensive agriculture involving land-based animals, the techniques and technologies differ and thus require a different form of analysis. I shall briefly discuss each now, wild fish capture and industrial aquaculture as a mod modality of population biopolitics before turning to look at the fish farm in particular as a new site for the production of a biopolitical bear life. Let me start then with wild fish capture. In line with Patel, Patel and Moore's analysis presented above, industrialization of wild capture fisheries has led to the cheapening of seafood. That is through the application of technologies and efficiencies, more animals are able to be captured for a lower relative cost, thus driving down the long run consumer cost of seafood and incentivizing growing per capita consumption by humans of, of sea animals as a means of subsistence. And we've certainly seen this globally. However, as I've indicated above, this is not just a story about cheap food. Instead, from a biopolitical standpoint, this is a narrative at the level of population, or in this case, several populations, say several populations of fishes, being placed at the service of the life and functioning of another population, i.e. humans. Where this narrative of population biopolitics differs from land-based agriculture is that wild capture fisheries <coughs> do not install these living animals within the factory farm. Instead, fish populations who are otherwise self-containing are hunted down by humans <coughs> to be transformed into food commodities. <coughs> I've previously argued that the factory farm establishes a juridical zone of exception which produces a concentrated site for biopolitical violence. This violence is not merely concerned with the process of slaughter, but also relies upon a ruthless management of life, controls over movement, lighting, temperature, nutrition, reproduction, and sociality. However, in industrialized wild capture fisheries, the zone of exception is not internal to the farm or even the nation state. Wild capture fisheries operate within zones which have juridically been treated as outside, quote, outside the reach of any nation state. Wild capture fisheries typically operate within the global commons of the sea. 
they represent a large scale and unique form of biopolitical state immunization. These fisheries reach into these commons established by international law um, and directly employ process of trans, uh, processes of violence to transform what was previously held in common to what is privately owned. While various quota regimes have been established to try and regulate wild capture fisheries, they have by and large proved not successful in curtailing the slaughter that we see on the oceans. This has uh, led to widespread havoc, decimating wild fish populations and systematically debilitating the capacity of some fish species to reproduce themselves as collectives. <clears throat> this means that during the 20th century, there was an attempt to lock wild fish populations into a biopolitical relation with human populations through wild fish capture. This is certainly a story of an ongoing war in the way that I've described in some of my work. However, in some respects, this war proved unsuccessful. And this is because the war relied upon fish populations being able to reproduce themselves within the commons of the sea. Unfortunately, by the close of the 20th century, due to the violence of human interventions on the seas, fish po populations lost the capacity to reproduce themselves and depleted globally. It was clear that the project was failing. <coughs> The solution was the development of industrial scale aquaculture. At the level of population, aquaculture innovates and addresses the limits of wild fish capture in its ability to achieve biopolitical domination of animals. Firstly, at a population level, the unsustainable debilitation of wild fish populations and the resistance of fishes themselves to being caught is addressed by placing sea animals within perpetual enclosure. Thus, an episodic biopolitical violence is replaced by something that is more continuous in form. And there's subsequently a reorientation of the human relation with sea animals from being one of being the hunter to being the shepherd. Secondly, as I shall discuss soon, aquaculture provides an opportunity to completely internalize the population by containing fishes and deploying intensive husbandry techniques, including controls over reproduction. These biopolitical processes are interconnected with the development of capitalism as an economic system. As I, something I outline in my recent book, Animals and Capital, is a theory of, of subsumption that I find in the work of Karl Marx. In his draft, chapter six of Capital, volume one, Karl Marx used the word subsumption to describe the process by which productive processes and labor are drawn into the value circuits of capitalism. Here Marx delineated between so-called formal subsumption, where capitalism co-ops and engulfs an existing process, which was previously outside cap the capitalist value production, and real subsumption, where production process is integrated into capitalist production in a deep, an inseparable way. One way to explain all this might be as follows. If we think about writing work, say a work, the work of a novelist or an academic, <coughs> a formal subsumption of writing work might involve a business paying a writer to do what they previously did in their own time at home, but to do so for money. Here the writer becomes the worker because they are being paid but the actual nature of their labor, they might still sit at home doing this work, remains the same. A real subsumption, on the other hand, moves this work completely into the production process. So it is almost impossible to imagine this work happening in ways that are disconnected from the technologies of production. For example, if, there, if we could imagine on an online platform that provides the technologies payment systems and promotion that enables content to be produced, then this would be an example of a, um, a real subsumption in that any labor that occurs within that, that ecosystem is inseparable from the technologies that produce it. In, in this form of subsumption, the worker and their work becomes inseparable from machines, technologies, and flows of capital. <clears throat> These processes, and the reason why I wanted to share that with you is uh, is that they are relevant to the development of aquaculture. 
The triumph of aquaculture represents a movement from formal subsumption to real subsumption. So on the left here, we see the trawler vessel. On the right here, we see the aquaculture facility. A previously wild population, i.e. a wild in the sea population, whose own self-reproduction occurred through its own processes, is parasitically fed upon by the trawler vessels, vessel for both sustenance and profit by human populations through industrial predation up until that point at which it is no longer possible to sustain this form of extraction. Aquaculture thus solves the problem. As soon as the fish dry up on the ocean, aquaculture solves this by internalizing whole fish populations within the rhythms of capitalist production, deploying continuous techniques to control reproduction and intensively manage fish life. Under this model of real subsumption, fish lives are molded so that they conform absolutely to the production process in ways that transform these beings into organisms that are no longer fit for the wild. <clears throat> Here we might note that this story about the establishment of fishes as a population, which is made fit for purpose for capitalist production, is in perfect alignment with Michel Foucault's understanding of the relationship between biopower and capitalism. And we find this in um, The History of Sexuality, Volume 1. Foucault says, and I quote, this biopower was without question an indispensable element in the development of capitalism. The latter would not have been possible without the controlled insertion of bodies into the machinery of production and the adjustment of the phenomena of population to economic processes. The adjustment of the accumulation of men to, the, to that of capital the joining of the growth of human groups to the expansion of productive forces and the differential allocation of profit were made possible in part by the exercise of biopower in its many forms and modes of application. The investment of the body, its valorization, and the distributive management of its forces were at the time indispensable, end quote. <clears throat> Here, no doubt, to co is explicit about the meaning of biopower for the alignment of human groups within capitalism. However, these processes might simultaneously describe the controlled insertion of non-human life into the machinery of capitalism. We, of course, see this in the land-based factory farm, but we also see this very clearly in aquaculture. This is about the mass production of bodies to be inserted into the, the belly and production processes of capitalism to produce a means of subsistence. And of course, these living beings experiencing mass violence along the way. Taking a global perspective then, the last century has seen a remarkable transformation in the population level biopolitics of global fisheries. The initial project aimed at using mechanization to hunt down fishes and kill, and it kills and continues to kill trillions of fishes annually. As this project reached its sustainability limits, then a change of strategy was needed. A process of real subsumption began where the containment and husbandry techniques, which were commonplace in land-based agriculture, were adapted in earnest to fish populations. Again, human populations are placed into, into a relation of domination with respect to fish populations. However, here in aquaculture, they are captured in a total sense. The fish farm takes control of reproduction, bare biological needs through the life course, and of course transforms these living beings into dead commodities through price control, over, precise control over the means of extinguishing life. The commons of the sea is now not the only zone of exception for the production of fishes for food. More prominently today, it is the sea enclosure, the factory farm for fishes, that is the site. <coughs> it is here, that I'd like to move to the second part of my paper, where I'd like to shift to examine aquaculture itself, the factory farm for fishers, as an example of a site for concentrated biopolitics. The intensive aquaculture facility is a factory farm of sorts, but differs in form and processes from intensive animal agriculture involving land-based animals. I have previously argued, following the work of a gambon, that the factory farm produces bare life through techniques which systematically hold the living beings within on a threshold between life and death. This is starkly apparent 
when we when the conditions and resources provided to animals in production facilities debilitate key animal capabilities in order to efficiently produce food for as a commodity. For example, the systematic injuries that many animals experience in factory farms as a result of crowding or inability to exercise and the use of selective breeding to maximise yield. Arguably, as I argue, we see strong resonances of all of this in intensive aquaculture, where ruthless controls aim at precisely mapping biological life to the production cycle in order to maximise profit. Aquaculture could be broken into at least three categories, open systems, semi-closed and closed systems. <clears throat> in an open system, a suitable site is located within a natural body of water and a permeable cage is installed. In these systems, enclosed fishes share waters with other sea life outside the cage. Tides and currents are relied upon to dissipate waste and nutrients are available either naturally in the cage environment or through the addition of feed by producers. Oxygen levels, water temperatures and waste are thus left to the vicissitudes of the surrounding environment. And this is also why um, open aquaculture systems are a disaster for the seas because everything that is fed to these fishes goes out and everything that leaves these fishes goes out into the open sea. <clears throat> in a semi-closed system, natural waters may be accessed, but there is an effort towards um, supplementing or enhancing natural processes through more intensive controls over water temperatures and oxygen levels. Finally, in closed systems, we, saw, we see the whole production process controlled so that every aspect of the aquaculture system um, involves some sort of human intervention. So typically in a closed, closed system, sometimes these are terrestrial systems, so they happen on land and everything is enclosed by the producer. Here, as James Tidwell describes, and I quote, um, the major advantage of closed systems is that they provide the operator complete control over all of the environmental variables in the culture of the system. The major disadvantage, of course, of closed systems, Tidwell goes on, is that the oper operator now has complete responsibility for all aspects of the animal's environment, i.e. complete biopolitical control. Again, from the standpoint of Marx's theory of subsumption described previously, here we see in these different systems, open, semi-open and closed, a transition in subsumption. Right? So there's a movement from a, uh, a formal subsumption to a real one where animals in, the, in this model, in, in closed systems, are completely encapsulated by the production process. Regardless of type of aquaculture system, there are a number of features of these fish factory farms that are distinctive. Firstly, like all factory farm systems, enclosure is a prominent modality of domination. In open systems, this enclosure occurs in the landscapes of the sea, as it were, and functions in a similar way to, say, a fence, pasture or paddock. In closed systems, the entire living area of the contained being is constructed by human artifice, with tanks manufactured from plastic, fiberglass or stainless steel. Movements to other enclosures as part of the production cycle are common in more complex production systems. However, in some systems, fishes may spend their entire lives within the same enclosures. <clears throat> the point of enclosure is to lock these beings into the desired stage of production and limit mobilities within the confine, confines of the cage or tank. In some systems, sea cages are located in close proximity to each other, either littered across seas or across inland water systems. Alternatively, in closed terrestrial aquaculture, multiple tanks are sequestered within a large enclosed factory. These systems today are now extensive. There are apparently more than 3,000 sea cages along the coast of Norway. And by the turn of the 21st century, some 30% of lakes and reservoirs in China are being used for aquaculture. To an extent, these represent a growing archipelago of confinement. Though their form, either in sea cages or closed terrestrial systems, 
does not directly resemble other forms of carcerality. Aside from the obvious difference in form, i.e. land-based animals require air, fishes need to be immersed in sea, in water, <clears throat> an important difference between aquaculture and aquaculture system and the factory farm involves um, involving land-based animals relates to the different techniques used in relation to partitioning or sequestration. Unlike the typical factory farm for land-based animals, within aquaculture, there's no close range partitioning of single animals or small groups of animals, such as we'd find in, say, a battery cage in a, in a factory farm. Instead, large numbers of fishes, sometimes over 100,000, in the case of commercial salmon cages, are congregated together in a single enclosure. Indeed, while stocking densities are central to all forms of the, the economics of all forms of animal agriculture, within aquaculture, they are very much overtly informed, um, they very much overtly inform um, the productivity of those systems. This produces a unique carcerality that is by and large managed at the level of the collective rather than the individual. As I should discuss this as a shaping effect on what resistance looks like in these systems. Control over reproduction is another central aspect of almost all systems of animal domestication. It's therefore not accidental that controls over reproduction are irreplaceable, are irre, are, are an irreplaceable aspect of industrial aquaculture systems. Hatcheries are an important part of the value chain providing juvenile animals to aquaculture systems. In some hatchery systems, a natural process of reproduction is managed within, within ponds and closed enclosures to en enable product the production of eggs which will be extracted from the system. In other systems, fish are brutally strip spawned, a process of egg extraction that may involve the injection of ovulation in, in, in inducing hormones, manual expression of eggs at ovulation and the fertilization of the, end of the eggs with sperm. These hatchery systems then feed aquaculture with their raw materials, that is living bodies that will mature into, into a future consumption commodity. In this context, as in industrial agriculture involving land-based animals, the life and death processes that are required to transform living animals into dead meat require an, an attendant biopolitical process for the creation of life. That is a standing army of bodies who are exploited for their reproductive capacity in order to enable, quote from Foucault, the controlled insertion of bodies into the machinery of production, end quote. The space of the enclosure is a site of varying degrees of intensive biopolitical management. As described above, the enclosure delimits movement in more intensive systems, water temperature and oxygen levels are ruthlessly controlled. In a closed system, manipulation of light can be utilized to shape behavior. Of particular note are the controls over food and nutrition, as this is subject to particular in, particular in, particularly intense forms of control. A characteristic of all intensive animal agriculture is control over nutrition through the use of manufactured feed. In the case of aquaculture, as fish farms expand, so does the global utilization of manufactured feed. Though some forms of aquaculture rely on plant-based inputs, in many cases, fishes in aquaculture are fed fish meal and fish oil for profit maximization. Precise control of feed is one way in which a balance is struck to enable fishes within a system to be held at the point at which um, nutrition is maximized and simultaneously yield is maximized. It is worth contemplating the different techniques and technologies that are, impl are implemented within aquaculture systems to meet this challenge. In the past, models were used to, mathematical models were used to estimate via regression analysis, um, what sort of feed availability should be made available to, within, to fishes within uh, an aquaculture facility. Bioenergetic models were used to calculate energy use by fishes, fishes so as to determine what appropriate levels of feed would be administered to the facility. However, more sophisticated technologies are emerging, including the use of video and acoustic surveillance systems to provide real-time monitoring of fish feeding behavior. And more re recently, intelligent feeding systems 
have been deployed to make use of artificial intelligence. Zhao et al. describe a system in Norway that has feedback mechanisms that detect the feeding behavior of fish until the feed is finished, which allows fish to be fed to satiation without overfeeding and consequent food waste. Computer vision and acoustic sensors are commonly used and fe use feedback mechanisms to determine feeding conditions in practice. They collect environmental, behavioral, and other data as input variables to control program to achieve intelligent feeding, end quote. Here, a host of technologies attempt to zero in on the exact point at which feeding practices are efficient. The use of artificial intelligence and developments in, developments in the Internet of Things based aquaculture are part of a general movement which has expanded the capital, inten capital intensity of fish farms, simultaneously reducing human labour power as a direct input to production. In this regard, intensive aquaculture is working in lockstep with agriculture systems centred on land-based animals where full automation of production appears to be the long-term, long-run trajectory. In a sense, this trajectory brings together a number of tendencies within capitalist production, including a demand to deploy technologies of surveillance and artificial intelligence to ruthlessly control nutrition, movement and environment, to make efficient input, inputs, reduce turnover times, reduce human labour time and maximise possible surplus. Here, as Wang et al. suggests, a kind of dream of the intelligent automated fish farm is currently being realised. The intelligent fish farm is an all weather, full process and full space automated production mode. Intelligent fish farms rely on digital and intelligent technology to solve the problems of aquaculture labour shortage, water pollution, high risk and low efficiency. Intelligent fish farm is the industrial transformation of fishery production mo mode and the development direction of fisheries in the future. I have previously argued that a tendency within animal agriculture is that as human labour power is replaced by machines, there's a rise in the mass of animals or animal labour power, which stands in relation therefore with enclosures and machines. In some respects, that is what the factory farm is. Humans disappear and animals have to confront machines and enclosures and mechanised forms of production. From a biopolitical standpoint, we see here that intensification, that is the process of expanding the use of enclosures, machines and technologies, is accompanied by an expansion in animal population caught within agricultural systems, subject to ever tightening regimes of control. Perhaps because of the general, generally limited applicability of welfare precautions within fisheries, arguably the most intensive forms of containment and control happen within aquaculture. Further, arguably given growing per capita consumption of seafood product, products globally um, and an exponentially expanding aquaculture sector, the fish factory farm perhaps, represent, perhaps represents the full realisation of the biopolitical dream of the factory farm itself as, the, as an idealised mo model of domination. This is, that is, this is a dream to establish an environment where inputs to production are perfectly calculated to ensure maximum profitability. The body of the animal is the site for this bare calculation. It is here that I would like to conclude by thinking about fisheries, fishers themselves, and the capacity these beings possess within industrial aquaculture to resist these processes of domination and violence. We might note that one aspect of the transition I've described from open to closed aquaculture systems reflects the development of techniques to counter the resistance of fish themselves to their own capture. One deficiency of open aquaculture system, i.e. those sea, sea cages in the sea, um, is, is the capacity of fishes to escape. A situation that is not merely a cause of concern for producers in relation to loss of profitability, but also potential concern for environments. And there've been a number of dramatic mass sea, um, sea cage escapes that have caused environmental catastrophes around them. Escapes are a significant aspect of some aquaculture systems, representing average, quote, average production losses between one and 5% per year, um, either through low leakage, um, low level leakage um, of those systems, or massive events where millions of fish are released, end quote. 
In this respect, we could argue that within open aquaculture systems, fish resistance to capture is a continuing site of friction and marks the insubordination of fishes to an otherwise seemingly total system of domination. However, closed aquacultural systems largely solve the problems associated with escape. So once you enclose and move those systems onto land, then suddenly escape as an option for fishes disappears. The closed system produces an environment that is completely managed by producers and establishes the infrastructure for continuing development and surveillance and monitoring. However, even in, complete, in the complete and austere context of closed systems, there remain continuing challenges for producers in maintaining continuous forms of domination control. This is because despite the development of surveillance technologies within intelligent facilities, there are limits to what can be seen within the space of the sea cage or the tank. This is because these tanks contain potentially hundreds of thousands of fish. Um, it is for this reason that John Law has noted that with respect to salmon farms, within these aquaculture fish environments, fishes defy actively and in a daily way, defy systems of control and detection. Law says, and I quote, the salmon in the pen are more or less invisible. Sometimes you can see what's going on, but most of the time you can't. Instead, all you can see is a few dozen salmon out of 50,000. This is the paradox. Even though they are being controlled, the salmon are dissolving themselves into invisibility. So this is the argument. If salmons are, uh, if salmons are animals, this is precisely because in relation to human beings, they are also elusive. Down there in the water, so far as people, the people are concerned, they are also doing their own sweet salmon thing, end quote. <clears throat> the more or less visible status of fishes within aquaculture means there is potentially substantial scope for resistance for at least some fishes within aquaculture systems. However, it's important to note that producers actively work against this resistance in the name of productivity. We can see this tussle between fishes and aquaculture facilities play out when we consider some of the problems associated with transporting live fishes within the context of aquaculture. Transporting or moving fishes, um, including the processes of capture and handling fishes prior and after transport, are typically highly stressful for fishes and can lead to injury and death for some fish. In many scenarios, fish must be mechanically transferred using these large braille nets, which inevitably calls, cause injury, trauma, and mortality. One area of innovation in order to solve this problem has been the development of fish pumps. Instead of attempting to net vast numbers of animals who do not want to be caught, the fish pump, pump promises a smooth and apparently frictionless absorption and transfer, transfer of large numbers of fish from one point of production in, in the production process to another. Typically these devices, these fish pump, pumps, involve the use of a large flexible hose connected to a large vacuum pumped, pump, which is designed to suck animals into it. It is like a large vacuum cleaner filled with water and it allows the fish pump to move large numbers of fish from one place in the aquaculture facility to another, apparently seamlessly. At least one advantage of the fish pump is that it has quote, strong labor saving potential. The fish pump just re device replaces the messy antagonism of humans attempting to net struggling fish with an automated system, which simply sucks animals towards desired points of production. Although the fish pump appears to nullify resistance, we should, not, we should not pretend, however, that the fish pump removes the friction of will between fi fish, fishes and aquaculture producers, or in this case, the friction between fishes and capital, the fixed capital, enclosures, technologies, machines. We still find this conflict here. Indeed, the point of the fish pump as a technology is to respond to this conflict through the deployment of technologies and, and machines to overcome the resistance of fishes. The arrival of the fish pump attempts to quell resistance. However, fish resistance continues regardless in different forms. Here I'd like to study, refer to one study conducted by Dutch researchers on the impacts of pumping, uh, of fish pumps and fish pumping stations on fishes and eels. 
The researchers looked at the mortality rates of fishes and eels based on different pressures, flow rates, and animal sizes within pumps. It's a pretty horrific experiment. <clears throat> a transparent PVC pipe was constructed, and the researchers used video imaging to capture the movement of fish within the pumps in an attempt to understand their behaviour and how the orientation of fish shaped injury rates. However, the results were curious. The researchers observed the fish swimming backwards. Indeed, the researchers looked at this and said, this is, a, this is an example of resistance, and this is odd for scientific researchers to note this. The, the researchers said, and I quote, fish were seen to resist pumping by swimming in an upstream direction away from the pump. A number of fish succeeded to escape during tests and took shelter in, in a, a large container, container upstream of the shelter box. While this might perhaps signal cause for hope in the capacity of fishes to innovate in their attempts to resist the, the, the devious me machines that are placed against them, it would be a mistake on this basis to assume that fish resistance in agriculture system, systems is always inevitable or that producers won't, will stop trying to find new ways to innovate. As I mentioned, the fish pump responds to the reality of fish resistance, and it does so by quelling it. Technological change in the future will continue to be driven by the need to quell resistance in the name of profitability. If fish pumps prove ineffective, other technologies are being developed as we speak, and some of them are even more ominous. Allow me to share one example. Another solution to the dilemma of how to transport fish is ex uh, has been ex that has been explored by aquaculture producers is the use of mass anesthesia, which knocks the fish fishes unconscious during the period of transport. Some researchers have done experiments on this, which suggests that ideally, quote, the anesthetic should, quote, produce rapid anesthesia um, and allow rapid recovery after five minutes, be cheap, practical to use, water soluble, and leave no residue in fish, humans, and the environment. And researchers are currently trying to find ways to make this anesthetic a reality. In some respects, being able to knock animals out during key phases of the production cycle reveals a further extension of the dream of the factory farm, which continually seeks to smooth all possibility of tussle and friction from the processes which animals are subject to. In this case, fishes are knocked out insensible for periods of time, where an alteration of the living environment is required only to recover again to the horrific boredom and daily hostility of the densely packed sea pen. I raise this final example to highlight the diabolical assembly of powers within contemporary aquaculture facilities. Intensive animal agriculture involving, involving land animals in many respects represents one bio, example of biopolitical violence at its most calculating, its most developed, it's most intense. Arguably, industrial aquaculture further refines this project. The near complete absence of welfare protect protections in fisheries allows for, for a belligerent and continuing refinement in techniques of violence and domination. It is here in conclusion that I note that in line with the argument presented in my recent book, Animals and Capital, the 20th century has seen a remarkable, remarkable collision between a hierarchical anthropocentrism and capitalism. The factory farm represents one, uh, one of the outcomes of this collision. However, I would argue that is the space of fisheries that we see perhaps the most intense and unfettered forms of this biopolitical violence. Industrial aquaculture in some respects represents the ultimate realization of the goals of the factory farm. Indeed, we perhaps see the most significant realization of the dream of population biopolitics itself. The paradox is that while fisheries represent the most extensive form of human violence towards animals, fishers have received the least attention from animal advocates themselves. It is the goal of my work to draw attention to the extent of this violence in the hope that we can change it. Thanks so much.